Amen. Thanks, guys. Uh, the great singing, really appreciating it. And it's my pleasure to bring the Bible reading to you tonight. And we're going to be reading from Ephesians uh, chapter 4 and 5, and I'm reading in the NIV. So it's Ephesians chapter 4 as we continue our studies in this book. And it's starting at verse 17, reading through to chapter 5, verse 20. And it's titled Instructions for Christian Living. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and you were taught in him according with the, in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbour, for you are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work and do something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those who are in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this, you can be sure, no immoral, impure or greedy person such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For once you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why it is said... Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, 
be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we look forward to uh, Miriam speaking to us about this tonight. Let's just pray for her as she brings the message. Father God, we just thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for your word, which we have just shared together. And Lord, we look forward to hearing Miriam speak about it. We ask that your spirit will just speak through her to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, David. And hi, everyone. My name is Miriam. If you didn't get that through the multiple references to my name, Sarah. And um, it's a real joy to be here and sharing with you this evening. And thanks, David, for sharing um, the Bible reading as well. That's quite a mouthful when Paul gets into his run on sentences. So well done. Now, there is uh, this is a massive passage. Even even the length of the uh, reading will tell you that. Um, there's a lot of content packed into these 40 odd verses. And when I was chatting to um, Nick Tui, our former senior, former senior pastor, about uh, we were doing the handover for our Optus uh, account, and um, and he said, oh, what are you doing? I said, I'm working on sermon prep. This is the passage. And he said, oh, yeah, that's a big one. Sorry. Um, so thanks, Nick. But actually, thank you, um, because it is a really good passage to get into. Um, he also suggested that we use the Optus changeover as an example of the transition between the old and new life. But I think I'll, I'll use a different metaphor in the end. So I'm not going to be able to get into all of the specific details of this glorious passage in the next 22 0.5 minutes. Um, but I am going to try and give us a bit of an overview of the context in, within Ephesians and then an overview of the structure of the verses themselves. And then we're going to pick out two or three particular verses to look at and explore. So first of all, let's have a look at the context. So writing, as you may remember from prison, Paul is sending his greetings to one or several churches in the area of Ephesus. Uh, and he has spent the first few chapters reiterating what the gospel is, what the mystery of this good news is, and how it impacts the mostly Gentiles that he's writing to. Then he begins to emphasise the importance of unity in the church and spiritual maturity in its people. So it's not an accident that this next passage focuses on sin and righteousness. This is the distinction between the old and new life. This change, this stepping away from sin, is the direct outcome of the mystery of the gospel that he explored earlier and is essential to the unity of the church. Taking our sin seriously as individuals has direct and urgent implications on the health of the church as a whole. This is not just about be good, don't be bad, or even a call to leave a life of sin as an individual concept. If we want to be a unified church of the sort that Jeff explored last week in his sermon, we need to take seriously the state of our hearts as individuals within that community. A new life in Christ requires a new way of living and accountability to a new community. So that's some overall context. And now into the structure and shape of this particular passage. Paul spends these verses exploring the distinction between old and new, the opposing pairs of sin and righteousness, the difference that there is to be between his audience and their erstwhile, their former communities. And in the same way, it's a call for us, today's listeners, and how we are to be different, primarily identified primarily by Christ, not by our sin or our tribe or our political party or our history. He begins with testifying, this word used to introduce a solemn declaration. I say and testify in the Lord, he says, and this is a silencing statement at which all small talk, all chatter, all irre irrelevant mumblings and daydreamings is called to a halt. What he's about to say matters, and it's serious. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, he says, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Or as Eugene Peterson puts it in his message interpretation, and so I insist, and God bats me up, that there be no going along with the crowd, the empty-headed, mindless crowd. Before encountering Jesus through Paul's words and life, the Gentiles had been as one with their neighbours, with no distinguishing features. 
And now they're part of the family of God with the Jews. And then while they're not called to be circumcised, that is a physical distinction from their neighbours, they are called, they must, they need, they have to be separate from their original Gentile communities in the way that they live their lives. They've been invited into the set apart community. And to be a part of that community, they must live lives that are set apart as well. So how are they to be different? Their old mob, Paul says, were ignorant, and not because they're uneducated or intellectually deficient, but because they're unable to access God's truth without accepting God's spirit. They had become callous. And I love that word because it's a really strong image. Uh, the idea of a heart that is so calloused, well, the heart that has calluses on it at all is a really intense and confronting image. And I remember a story once told me uh, about why you shouldn't travel in a particular region without and go camping without your boots on uh, or sleeping without your boots on at night. Um, and the reason for this is because a whole bunch of people had gone camping and they discovered if they slept without their boots on, rats would come and chew at their feet, um, which is a horrible image. And then the local farmers didn't have a problem with this because they had walked outside so often, they had worked in bare feet for so long, um, they spent most of the year in bare feet, they had such strong calluses on their feet that they didn't even feel when the rats came to chew on their feet. They didn't even notice that these disease-carrying vermin were basically feasting on their flesh. And that's a pretty awful image. And if you, I can see Mark Jell is just shaking his head there, yeah. <laughs> it is awful and it's meant to be because imagine having a heart that calloused, so rough, so hard against God that sin could feast on it without our noticing. And you couldn't even hear God if you wanted to. And that's how all of us are before Christ's spirit enables us to hear him if we accept that gift. And it's only through his spirit that we can hear, not through our own intelligence or abilities. And that hardness of heart is the same language that's used in Mark chapter 3, verse 5, where Jesus is grieved by the hardness of the Pharisees' hearts as they actively get in the way of his healing because it's happening on the Sabbath. They have such calloused hearts, they can't even see the Messiah right in front of them, and they actively block his healing work. So the Gentiles Paul is writing to used to have hearts so calloused that vermin, sin could feast and thrive in them and they would not notice. And in the same way, their original community were still that callous towards God and had given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. They're not just inert to sin, to sexual and other immorality, but they're eager to see how far they can take it, how far they can explore this world because sinful desires are never satisfied. But, Paul says, this is not the way you learned in Jesus. Did you really learn in Jesus, says Paul? Then you can't be living this way. You can't try and see how close to the abyss you can get. If you've really met Jesus, then you know that you need to put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through your deceitful desires. These desires that promise freedom but deceive us into short-lived highs and long-term emptiness and loneliness. So what does it mean to put off your old self? Like Nicodemus being told as an old man that he must be born again, when we really think about it, it's a really strange statement. How do we take off our old selves? And it's hard to understand, and it would have been for the Ephesian Gentiles as well. Paul kind of expands on this a bit in Colossians 3, so I'm just going to read you a section from Colossians chapter 3. Since then, he says, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, Paul continues, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have, been taken, you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on your new self, which has been renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all 
and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you as richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And we're hearing some parallels with Ephesians chapter 4. In multiple letters, Paul describes this putting off of our old selves and putting on of our new selves with new communities, new practices, new knowledge, and a new image of God. We put to death our old practices by intentionally neglecting to feed them with our time and our practice. And in this passage, Paul explores this contrast as sets of pairs of old ways and new ways, or sins and their opposing righteousness. But there are opposites that we wouldn't often expect. So firstly, in verses 18 to 19, as we explored earlier, we see community given over to sensuality and greed, as opposed to a community in verse 20 that is reborn, made new, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And that righteousness and holiness is expressed through putting off falsehood and instead speaking truth. There is the first of several references to anger, but we'll come back to that. But I do want to take a moment to focus on this next pairing. He talks about stealing, and he says that those who stole must stop stealing and start being productive, independent, and generous. This statement is not just about stopping sinning. It's about stepping into a completely opposing life, that of God-given work and generosity. A Bible lecturer of mine back in the day once shared with me how a student had come and confessed a deeply personal and broken sin that they were struggling to resist returning to consistently. And they described how hard they had battled to break the pattern of the sin and not succeeded. And my lecturer recalled how he had challenged the student to spend less time concentrating on the sin, on all the things he was not meant to do, but rather to be thinking on things that were of God, that filled his mind with beauty and built up the body of Christ. In the end, he would be so focused on the beauty of Christ and on the good works that he was called to do, that he would have no time, no space in his head to be distracted into his sin. And I also remember a book on sexual immorality that describes how sin must oft, most often popped up when we are bored, lonely, hungry, tired. And I'm going to add angry in there as well. It's so simple. Let's do that again. Bored, lonely, hungry, tired, angry. So to stop sin is not just to give up something. It's to fill our lives with something better and to deal with the practical triggers that open us up to temptation. Do not steal. Instead, work and be generous. Paul goes on with his pairs and we'll move through them quickly. Rejecting corrupting talk and instead speaking only that which will build others up. For we are members of one another. And you'll notice these sins that he focuses on are ones that damage the community as well as the individual, which all sins do, but these ones in particular. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, he says. When we sin, we insult the very being who saved us from the consequences of our sin, who has sealed us into the day of redemption. Bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and slander and malice come next. Let's take a moment to think about Paul's language of anger. So early in verse 26, he says, in your anger, do not sin. Or in my translation, be angry and do not sin. And we know from John 2.13 that Jesus did get angry, but I would suggest he didn't get angry impulsively, even though he cleared a temple court with a whip and he overturned tables and he drove out market tenders and stall holders. This was not the first time that he had come into the temple. In fact, he would have been there dozens of times over the years preceding this, and he had in fact been there just a few days before, and he chose intentionally to go back and react to sin at this time. So while God does rage against sin and injustice, there are so many sins that we mistake for righteous anger because we don't do it well. 
To hold on to anger even overnight, as Paul describes, can give the devil a foothold. And that's a powerful and confronting image. And it's humbling for me. I know that I can really carry a grudge if I feel like my trust has been broken. And I can carry it in the name of justice or of righteousness, of challenging the oppressor. And all those things are important. But if my righteous anger carries any element of bitterness, wrath, unrighteous anger, clamor, slander, malice, then I've given the devil a foothold. I've planted the seeds of destruction. And I know my anger so often does. So how do we do anger well? Unfortunately, we don't have three hours or three years to explore it in detail here, but I think there are a few clues that we find in the following verses. So first, we are to be kind and tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave us. If God, who has pursued Israel even when she acted the prostitute and fled into the arms of idolaters and destroyers, can forgive her so much, if he can forgive me so much, then I must be willing to forgive as he has. There is pretty much nothing. No, let me rephrase that. There is absolutely nothing I can take to God and say, well, even you wouldn't forgive this. While we are called to act in wisdom and therefore should not be foolish in allowing ourselves to be repeatedly sinned against, There is no sin so great that God cannot forgive it. And he gives us the grace to forgive that much too. It can take time and certainly practice, but he can take the weight of our hurt and enable us to forgive. And knowing how much we have been forgiven enables us to be kind and tender-hearted and forgiving of others. Next, in verses 3 to 4, we have another opposing pair. We have immorality versus thanksgiving. And Paul really strongly calls out impurity, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talk or crude jokes. And that's a hard word for today's culture when crude humour or sexual jokes make a, a big part of our language, of our media, of our popular narrative and of our conversation. And I don't think God is calling us to dismiss the perhaps strangely ridiculous nature of sex. That is what part of what makes sexual vulnerability so intimate. But any joke or funny story or language that dehumanizes a person and places sex outside of its place within marriage, that lusts or covets or idolizes after a person like they're a thing or after a thing like it is a person, Paul condemns that. But it's the opposite that is also interesting. The opposite is thanksgiving. So why would the opposite of immorality and covetousness be thanksgiving? I wonder if it's because both of those sins seek to find satisfaction in something other than God, making them into idols. And both of them can be equally challenged by giving thanks for the way that God alone can satisfy, complete, fulfill, and heal us. And this ties back to our question about anger. How can we resist the urge to sin in anger? by always and only living out of our identity as beloved children of God and giving thanks for that. When we live in thanksgiving, we don't need to hold onto our anger as if it's the only thing that will protect us. And that's so often the reason why we hold on to anger, isn't it? Because we don't believe that someone else is advocating for us. When we know who we are in Christ through daily practicing thanksgiving for what he has done, then we can be angry at injustice and fight for God's justice but we can also release the hurt of that experience to God who sustains us, his beloved children. And finally, one more pairing that teaches us how to live in Christ from verses 8 to 14. Here, not only is Paul calling his audience to take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but he is also calling them to expose them. And this is the act of actively rejecting and confessing sin. But when anything is exposed by the light, Paul says, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The act of confessing our sins to those in our immediate and, where necessary, our broader community is an act of bringing light and allowing God to transform even hard and difficult and confronting and dark things into light. And it removes chaos and shame, and it brings healing. Here, too, our personal sins are implicated in our corporate, our broader church. The healing of confession requires community. This applies to sins of anger and sins of every other kind, sexual immorality, malice, slander, falsehood, stealing, 
even grieving the Holy Spirit. We are accountable to our church, but our church too is accountable to us, helping us to heal through corporate and, when necessary, public confession and accountability. And it is, of course, just to touch on verse 18, that same desire for healing, forgetfulness, release from fear or anxiety that drives us towards drunkenness. And those are the very things that we find in the spirit, which, unlike drunkenness, which leads to debauchery, gives us the gifts of wisdom and grace and self-control. And so we end with music, of all things. Be filled with the spirit, says Paul, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why in there? Why is this the outcome of being filled with the spirit? Well, I wonder if it's because if our greatest weapon against bitterness and malice, lust and covetousness, immorality and theft is thanksgiving, which is the root emotion of generosity, then individual and corporate worship and song is the mark of a thankful church. We may be weary, overwhelmed, sinful and repenting, but where we can recognise that God's grace is still sufficient, then we will always have thanksgiving and we can, we can live the life of a set-apart community. And how does this tie into Christians not being chameleons? How does this impact our current times? Well, let me leave you with this question. Now, in the midst of a pandemic and a lockdown, can we be thankful? Can we avoid sinning in our anger, resisting the urge to dehumanise or demonise those we disagree with in leadership or in our friends or family circles? Do we allow our current sense of very understandable overwhelm or apathy to so swallow us and identify us that we open ourselves up to temptation and sin? And this is a hard call that Paul is asking of his audience and that Jesus asked of us. But in the spirit and only in the spirit, we as individuals and in the body of Christ are empowered to do it. We're all inadequate, but God helps us all. Our church is not so different to that of Ephesus back in Paul's day. We are offered a new set-apart life, and if we want to live it, we must be different, set-apart, holy, even and especially in a pandemic. And so in the spirit of Paul's words, let us sing together with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs and songs of thanksgiving. And I'll hand back over to Luke and Edge.